we want to look at the evidence that I believe is very powerful from the world of nature that there is a designer and if there is design and a designer then we have to seek out who that person is. It's only in my generation that we've come to appreciate what a wonderful world we live in with the ability to have pictures of the earth taken from space to see this beautiful jewel in the heavens which represents the earth upon which we live and it's it's full of beauty isn't it wherever we go and especially this time of year the trees and the flowers are absolutely staggering aren't they in their beauty and in the great variety of colors that exists in the world of nature and everywhere we see that there is design that one plant is dependent upon an insect for pollination a particular bee is dependent upon a certain flower for its nectar there's a whole world of interconnection between the different things that are created and it is an absolutely <coughs> amazing design with this interdependence and we have to ask you know what is the origins of all of this is there a God who has brought it into being as the Bible tells us and the introduction that we read spoke of the glory that the heavens declare concerning God's handiwork and this obviously is what we believe that the heavens have been brought into being and the earth and everything in it by a wonderful God but sadly the majority of the world population chooses to disregard the message of the Bible and seeks for an answer in time and chance and evolution. So we're going to look at the evidence I believe that points so strongly to a designer of this wonderful world. So we're going to look at uh, three main areas. We're going to look at the marvels of miniaturization, we're going to look at DNA and that coding information that contains the coding for life. We're going to look at molecular motors, uh, incredible little motors. Um, admittedly, that is an artistic representation of them, but they are incredible in what they do uh, and very minute. And we're going to look at the mitochondria, which is the, um, again, it is the energy producer in the cell, which gives the energy to the uh, whatever it is, a plant, a man or whatever. So those are three examples of miniaturization which I believe cry out that they have to be designed. They couldn't come about through chance. It's an utter impossibility. They all show design. As I say, if there is design, then it needs a designer. And then we're going to look at the miracles of marvels of migration and just look at the monarch butterfly and see how this little tiny creature is able to traverse vast distances and again it cries out this has been designed it couldn't possibly happen by chance that it was able to navigate over vast distances uh, it has to be designed and then last of all I just want to look very briefly at the incredible construction of the Bible now as we were reading that Psalm 19 it just switched instantly didn't it from looking at the world of nature around to the word of God and we believe that this word of God is of equally wonderful design uh, and we're just going to look at one aspect of that that cries out this couldn't be chance this indicates that there is a God this is his book uh, and therefore we should read what it has as a message so let's um, have a look and one of the things about the world of nature is that the more and more one looks at uh, things that nature is, has produced the more wonderful the design is whereas when one looks at man-made things the cruder they appear and we can take an example of that there's a, a 2000 times magnification of a pin now when we look at a pin, um, normal size as it were, it looks very smooth and very sharp and very pointed, but magnified up you can see just how blunt it is and how crude it is. And yet on this particular pin there are bacteria, 
And those bacteria, that's at 2,000 times uh, magnification. If we go up to 4,000, you can still see that there's nothing crude about them. That they look uh, designed, fashioned, shaped. This is E. coli bacteria, 10,000 times magnification. Uh, and this is pneumonia, 18,000 times magnification. Uh, and you can see that, that there is a, a beauty, a colour, a shape, a design. However, um, we magnify them up. Uh, it, it conveys to us a, a wonderful world, say, so completely different from any man-made thing, which just gets cruder and cruder the more one magnifies it. Now, in the human body, it is estimated there are about 60 trillion cells. And we're made up of all these cells, ashed together, as it were, and that comprises who we are. Now, in all those cells, in every single cell that we have in our bodies, estimated figures, 60 trillion of them, then each one of them has between 100 sorry, 1,000 to 2,000 unique properties. So each cell has unique properties. Some cells are blood cells, some are liver cells. They all have their function and they all have their coding. Mankind, however, knows almost nothing about these cells that form the most basic elements of our existence, how their properties interact with each other and how they function. This was actually a rather tongue-in-cheek advert in the Nature magazine some years ago. But it just uh, illustrated uh, what I want, that we've got lots and lots of cells. And each of those cells is a wonderful factory of, of many different parts, many of them unique to that particular cell that all play their role. And one has to say, you know, how did it all come about? How could it all evolve by chance? So numbers of cells, uh, nature advert had 60 trillion. Estimates vary. It's very difficult to count, isn't it? Um, how many cells you've got in your body. But estimates vary between 10 and 100 trillion. So, but we'll take the 60 trillion. And first of all, what I want to look at is the chromosomes, the DNA, the coding information which is in each cell. And various depictions of it, obviously, all these are artistic representations, but we know that's double helix with the coding information which enables information to be passed on, the DNA to split and reproduce as it were and carry that information forward and the DNA in every one of your 60 trillion cells um, contains an incredibly complex set of coded instructions for life each of our many cells contains a full set of these instructions which if stretched out will be two meters just over six uh, feet in length so, each of our cells, we've got 60 trillion of them, has packed inside it two metres worth, if it was all unravelled and stretched out, two metres worth of DNA. Now, that, that's an incredible amount of DNA in each body, and I just hope to illustrate it. Um, there's the Earth and there's the Sun. Uh, Three, eight, four thousand kilometres at 239,000 miles apart. Now, if each of our 60 trillion cells has got two metres worth of DNA, if we just divide by a thousand to get to kilometres, then we get to 120 million kilometres worth of DNA stored in your body. Now, and that's the distance uh, from the moon, to, or from the Earth to the moon. And it would take the equivalent of 150,000 round trips there and back again to go the distance of the DNA in your body. Now the last trip to, the manned trip to the moon was uh, back in 1972. And it took them four days to get... Um, Apollo 17 up to the moon um, 
Oh, and I spent some time there and then came back. But if we said, right, we're just going to the moon and back, and that's an eight-day round trip. So how long would it take to make 150,000 round trips? Well, it would be over 3,000 years. We would have to start off, if we wanted to have completed the trips backwards and forwards by now, we would have to start it off about 300 years before King David was born. And just go every four days up to the moon and four days back again. Uh, to go the distance of the DNA which is packed inside each one of us body. It's absolutely staggering. The sun, obviously, much further away, but again, 400 round trips to be the equivalent distance. Now, DNA carries the coding for life. And all the information required to specify the exact makeup of every human being on the Earth could be stored in a volume of DNA no bigger than a couple of aspirin tablets. So if you think of the teeming billions uh, on the earth, and if you want to know the figure, this was correct roughly. I mean, I can only estimate it, but uh, just before four o'clock this afternoon, I went in and the counter it just revolves around your eye, but uh, that was the uh, estimated population this afternoon of the earth. So if you want to take the specific DNA that makes me, me, and you, you, you could store all that of every living being in just the size of a couple of aspirin tablets. Which helps us to understand how God can store the information of all his sons and daughters who sleep in the dust, who's going to raise from the dead. DNA is the most efficient information storage system known to exist in the universe. We have all sorts of things, pen drives, um, hard drives, CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, but DNA outstreaks them all. This was uh, nature last year. Archivists are getting worried. How can we store all the information? Think of all the... Uh, videos that Stuart puts up. Well, that's just a little drop in the bucket to all that's going up around the world. And all the books, all the information, all the magazines, all the um, newspapers, the, the information that's going up every day is absolutely astronomical. And people want to be able to store it. At the moment, it's stored on the World Wide Web. Thousands of computers around the world store it. But they're saying, well, you know, we're going to run out of the ability to store all this information. And they're now turning to DNA. What nature has uh, evidently uh, evolved in their eyes, uh, an incredibly uh, wonderful system of storing information in a very small space. Uh, and although it's not as fast as uh, read writes of uh, hard disks and that kind of thing, its data retention, I know it's fairly small, but uh, 100 years compared with 10 year estimate for storage on a flash memory, the amount of energy it needs is an absolute fraction of anything else. And its density is uh, several terms higher, uh, 10 to the 19th compared with 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 13th. And it's estimated that you'd only need a, a kilogram of DNA to store all the information that's floating around on the World Wide Web and in all the libraries. It is so efficient in storage. Uh, and, and yet there it is. Is it just chance or has it been designed? We believe it's been designed. So the mitochondria are the... Uh, power sources really of the cells. There's a, a couple in this artistic representation of a cell and these are the, the wheels of life that produce the energy that is necessary for each cell. Again, you know, artistic representation, um, many complex parts, but there are within the cell walls of the mitochondria 
these rotating motors which spin at an amazing speed 6,000 revolutions per minute, not per hour, 6,000 revolutions. So in one minute, they're going around 6,000 times, spinning around. 200,000 times smaller than a pinhead uh, and packed within uh, the cell. There's estimated between hundreds to thousands uh, in each cell. Got these little whirling motors that go round. And so it's estimated that in your body you've got 10,000 million million little motors spinning around. Without them you will be dead. They provide the energy that keep you alive. Until recently we knew nothing about them. And yet they are such a basic requirement for life. We couldn't live without them. And yet there they are. Millions and millions and millions in your body. An absolute brilliant design. Built up of 31 different proteins uh, and thousands of amino acids which all have to be arranged in exactly the right order. Uh, and the wheel is caused to rotate through hydrogen ions in the cell wall. And the very basic part is a, a, a bent spindle which has got a kink in it and that, that kink is vital to life. So again artistic representation um, but you've got the element of the cell wall, you've got the rotor which is caused to rotate by these hydrogen ions going between the plus and the minus or the other way around um, and the speed can vary as is needed. Now on the top of this is four psi six kind of cells which are anchored. Three of them are alpha cells and three of them are beta cells and it's the beta cells that do all the work. The alpha ones are just there for supporting. And in between this cluster is this spindle which is rotating from the rotor at the bottom as I say with a, a, a kink in it. And in very crude terms, what, what that kink does is to open and close the beta cell. So as it comes around and pushes in the back of the cell, the cell opens, takes in ADP and phosphoric acid, and then as the spindle moves, it closes. And then the next time it comes around, so on the next rotation, it, it opens and what comes out is ATP, which is the energy. So it, it, it's taking in raw food, and as a spindle goes around, it processes that and then as it were, spits out energy. And the more energy that's needed, if you're running a marathon, then these spindles speed up and provide that energy. Absolutely um, in incredible miniaturization, and uh, so elegantly designed, everything has to be in the right place, but performing a vital function, supplying the energy to each cell as it needs it. So, as I say, every rotation of that spindle, because there are three beta cells, produces three lots of energy. Now these rotating motors are, are not just used in this particular aspect for creating food energy, but they are found uh, in all sorts of uses within not only human beings, but plants, um, fungi, bacteria, um, and, and even what they think of as very crude life, primitive life in the so-called Cambrian layer, right at the bottom of the evolutionary pile, as it were. They have these complex motors. So right from the beginning, if we're going to believe in evolution, you have to believe that these incredible motors came into being right there, you know. No half measures or anything like that. Everything has to be right for them to function. And they're used for other purposes, but using the same principle of a rotor, um, being moved around by the uh, hydrogen ions. And in this particular case, this is a flagellum on a bacteria, uh, and that rotary movement is uh, 
transferred into a spiral movement, which, when the bacteria is in liquid, will propel it from one place to another. So the, these are the basic uh, propellers um, on bacteria, crude, so-called simple life. Nothing is simple. There's nothing crude. But this is how people think of bacteria. Absolutely amazing um, propulsion systems. Now, all the food that the cell produces within the mitochondria needs transporting to the correct part of the cell. Let's say the cell's like a big factory and the food is being produced here and it might be needed there or there or there or there. And so there are these little tubes, um, microtubules. This artistic representation only has just uh, one, two, three, four, I can just see there. Uh, there. There's thousands of them in each cell, going from A to B to C to D, linking everywhere up. They perform two functions. One, when a cell divides, they form the... Uh, anchorage points so that when the cell splits then it holds the DNA and parts of the cells as they split so that you can get two cells forming and then they can split again so that's one function of the tubules but the other is the transportation and this is from the Stanford University website so I just checked it again this afternoon it's still the same Inside, the inside of a living cell has been compared to a train station at rush hour, with enzymes, chromosomes and other internal components constantly being shuttled um, along tiny fibrous tracks called microtubules. Unlike a congested city commute, cellular traffic is efficient and highly regulated, thanks in part to a group of proteins known as motor molecules that use microtubules to haul vital cargo through the cell. So it says, think of a, a, a cell, and you've got six trillion of them, think of that as being London. And think of the underground system there as being the microtubules in just one of your 60 trillion cells. And there are little motors, just like the underground trains, that shuttle, not people, but food, energy, from one place to another. And these little motors have feet, again, artistic representation, but they have uh, two main feet at the bottom, uh, and they carry their loads uh, up. This is the energy ADP um, being carried there. Now, this is a representation of the bottom part of a cell wall um, with alpha and beta cells. Uh, and then, you know, there'll be the equivalent up at the top there. This, this is a tube, just the bottom part of the tube. And uh, these are the little motors that walk along carrying their load. And the, the foot here moves and there it drops down on the next beta one there. Uh, the other one comes in a kind of sideways swing so that the thing doesn't twist at all. And step by step, I mean, e each step is uh, one thousandth millionth of a millimetre, absolutely tiny. But then the cell is very tiny. Uh, and so step by step, and hopefully if this works. So you can see, you know, one foot goes over, the other foot comes round. And it's, it's not showing the load, the load is carried up there. So going through these absolutely miniature cells, taking the right track, how the points work, nobody knows, but it will take the energy to where it is needed. Absolutely elegant solution. One just to say, you know, could that evolve? Because that needs so many parts to make it work. Uh, and it needs all the network, and it needs the energy for it to carry. You know, everything has to be there. Can't, you can't have a half a cell, or a quarter of a cell, or... Three quarters, I can't have 99% of us. You have to have everything there right at the beginning. So, you know, what makes sense, creation or evolution? Well, let's just have a look at the marvels of the migration of this little tiny butterfly. Um, it's mainly found in the United States. 
It's the only insect that we know of that migrates across a continent. Uh, some of them come down the east coast, the middle coast, but some of them come from Nova Scotia, which is the furthest tip of uh, Canada here, and travel a distance of 5,000 kilometers, 3,000 miles. Did I say 5,000? Yeah, 5,000, that's right. Uh, and that's an amazing trip, but what is so spectacular is that some of them don't go as the crow flies, but they hop from island to island. So they set off from Nova Scotia, travel southward to Bermuda, and then change tack to get to the Bahamas, down to Cuba, down to Jamaica, back to Guatemala, where uh, they breed. Now, not all butterflies make the whole journey. Sometimes uh, they lay eggs as they go along, and their parents will die, but the hatchlings will grow and eventually become butterflies. And they know, don't ask me how, I believe this is the hand of God, that if I've been born on Bermuda, I don't travel the same direction that my parents travel because I'll just go in the middle of nowhere. I have to go in that direction and then change and change. And in fact, by um, marking the butterflies, they know that some, they, um, some do complete the whole journey. Uh, and what's so amazing is that they go back to the same tree that they started off at, or that their parents started off at. It's just absolutely staggering. But we know how the butterfly comes from the caterpillar. It, it pupates, metamorphosis, absolutely amazing process that the caterpillar turns itself into a pupae, and then eventually out of that will emerge a butterfly. Now, how could that evolve? It's a little tiny creature, it's only got a brain five grams weight. And what emerges is an insect fit for the purpose of migrating. Because their wings have special buoyancy sacs upon them. And I've got four wings, each one of them with 1.4 million scales, and each of those scales is filled with air, gives it its buoyancy. So this little tiny creature, does say its brain weighed five uh, grams? No, the whole, the whole thing weighs five grams. It's, its brain is the size of a pinhead. But somebody who has studied the monarch migration and says, you know, when you look at it all, I believe that only a great creator could have designed such a wonderful flying machine, which is capable of travelling such vast distances, is capable of island hopping, is capable of going back to an exact tree. Now we would have a job to do that, wouldn't we? Bad enough trying to find the car in a car park, let alone going back to an exact tree that maybe our parents or our grandparents had started off at. Absolutely amazing. So uh, unless there was the hand of God in designing it, how could it learn to navigate? Uh, especially if it hadn't made the journey beforehand. It, it all points to a wonderful creator. So finally, as I said, you know, that, that psalm that we read just swung from the world of nature to the word of God. And I just want to look at one aspect, the incredible construction of the Bible. And those of us who have read and studied and love this Bible, we, we find that this book is as equally complex as the cell with all its amazing networks. You know, it, it links one with another, one passage with another, and a little phrase here makes sense of a phrase there, a happening here makes sense of an event thousands of years later. But the Bible that we have is constructed of many individual books 
It tells us right at the beginning that in the beginning God created uh, and we understand that God is the God of science, is the God of maths, is the God of nature. It's the same God that has made the world, has made all the laws, the laws of science, the laws of maths, the laws of nature. It all points to a great God, an orderly God. Uh, and the Bible is like the world that is made, full of design. And so we ask, why 66 books in the Bible? Well, we have to come to a construction that was made in the time of Moses, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. We have to go to the tabernacle to see why there are 66 books in the Bible. Now, Moses was told to construct the tabernacle according to the exact dimensions and details that God had revealed to him. We can see why. It just contained three major items of furniture, the lampstand, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and behind the veil in the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant. But what we're interested in is the lampstand. Now it's totally dark inside this uh, tabernacle, and it was the lampstand that gave the illumination so that the priest could work there. And it was an incredible piece of engineering because it was made from one piece of gold. So one slab of gold weighing a talent, uh, Holiab and Bezalel, through hammering and shaping, formed this seven-branched candlestick lampstand. On the top were seven lamps, on the top of the uh, six sideways branches on the central stem. Now, each of the branches was made up of a stylized almond flower. In our authorised version, it talks about a bowl, a knop, and a flower. The bowl is the calyx of the flower, the knop is the seed pod, and the flower is the flower. So it's based upon the almond flower, and the almond flower is very significant because it's one of the earliest to flower, beautiful white flowers, first tree to flower in Israel. And it speaks to us of the resurrection. And so God chose this almond flower, and uh, normally we don't get seed pods, calyx, and flowers together. As this uh, illustrates, you get the calyx at the bottom, I mean, you see it in that one there, and there's the flower. The seed pod comes after the flower has uh, faded. But in this stylized representation of the almond tree, there were all three elements, a calyx, a seed pod, and a flower. And each branch consisted of three three-part flowers. So we have, uh, and if there are any artists here who can redraw this, making it look a bit more like I think it was, I'd be very grateful, but this is something out of uh, a book. So there are three elements, um, the calyx, the seed um, pod, and the uh, flower. And I say I'll, I'll, that would look much better if it's down there, but it doesn't matter. Three parts, so that's one flower, two flowers, three flowers, built up of three elements. So in each branch there are nine elements and there are three branches coming out on that side. So uh, three times nine, not very difficult maths, even on a Sunday evening, is 27. So we've got 27 little elements there. There's a flower, a flower, a flower, a flower. So again we've got 12, 39. And this side is exactly the same as that side, so another 27. So we got uh, 27, 12, 27, which adds up to 66, which just happens to be the number of books that we have in our Bible. Um, those are the books of the Old Testament. Um, if we go down to Daniel, the end of the uh, major prophets, we've got 27 books. And then to the end of the Old Testament, we've got 12 books, 39 books in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we've got 27 books. So, um, again, you know, we see this wonderful symmetry in the candlestick. 
but it, it pivots around the prophets. And we have the New Testament and the stem and that side representing the 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 of the New, all, all in one symbol. And as I say, this gave light. And so it's very appropriate for the Word of God because this is our illumination. This is what guides us through life. This is the light that we have to walk in. Now that's our Bibles. We've got the whole completed Bible, but this was given for the benefit of the Jewish people. Um, the Hebrew Bible uh, contains the same books that we have, um, but just the Old Testament. And they don't have as many books as we do. They have the same books, but some books are grouped. So that 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and 1 Kings and 2 Kings is regarded as one book. 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah are regarded as another book. And all the minor prophets, they're all there, but they're regarded as one book. So as far as the Hebrews are concerned, and in the time of Jesus, Josephus uh, talked about the 22 books of our law, of our Bible, uh, so they have 22 books. So again, if we go back to the construction of the lampstand, and instead of thinking of each flower made up of three elements, we just think of them as a flower. So we've got one, two, three flowers, We've got three branches there, so we've got nine flowers on that side. We've got one, two, three, four. We've got four flowers here, and then exactly the same on the other side, so we've got uh, another nine there. If we add those together, then we get to 22. Now, the Hebrew Bible is, as I say, it contains the same books, some are amalgamated, and they are in a slightly different order. And if you just look at the Hebrew Bible, then we have um, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So just bear in mind that Samuel and Kings are all one book. So if we count up the books to there, we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the combined book. So we've got nine books up to there. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, we've got another four there. And then on this side, uh, bearing in mind Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles are on one book. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got nine there. So we've got the same pattern revolving around the prophets, a nine, four, nine. And that's exactly what we've got in the um, lampstand. Now, mathematically, I challenge anybody to be able to design one piece of furniture which is appropriate, lamp stand giving light, that not only contains the number of books that's going to be in the Hebrew Bible, but also conveys in the same piece of furniture the whole completed word. It, it points to a God. It points to somebody who knows all things. This is his word. The evidence for a designer is everywhere. Whether we look in the world of nature, whether we look at science, whether we look at mathematics, whether we look at the Bible, we see design. <coughs> it's not coincidence. This points to a wonderful creator. And I believe in a designer. And I believe that that designer is the God of the Bible. So, wherever we look, we have to say what makes sense. God, creator, as the explanation for everything, the complexity of wor the world and all the laws and that. <coughs> or are we going to think that it all came about through time and chance? I leave it to you. But if we believe that God is the creator, then we have in the pages of this book a wonderful message of hope that there is a kingdom to come and the Lord Jesus is going to come back and establish peace and righteousness and holiness upon this earth. And there is a work for men and women, you and me, to join the Lord Jesus in preparation for that wonderful day, which is surely, shortly to come.